Hello, David. Hi. Good evening, Lekene. How are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Yeah. So, are you in Lagos or Abuja or Kanu, Imo, which one, Potakot? I'm in Uyo. Really? Uyo? Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's not very uh, common to, to see somebody in Uyo. Hmm? doing the kind of things you are doing I, and now I'm, I'm not saying they're not doing it but i don't i say see okay well wow. you, are, you, are, you, are, you are not wrong it, it feels like an odd place to be yes if you are doing the things i do and many times it's you you feel like am i trapped in the wrong place <laughs> but you has its own benefits so mm. i love this it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a calm place. Yeah. So it allows you to innovate. It's the right place to innovate. It's a good place to think. Okay. Okay. Places like Lagos, they are too noisy. They won't, you won't get to really think in Lagos. Yeah. But this place wow. is quite calm. I mean, 15 minutes, I'm in my office. So yeah. it's, I love the city. I love the place. I've been yeah. here now, I, I think 12 years now. Wow. I came as a copper to serve. And you stayed? I stayed. Yeah. I just left. Beautiful. I think Beautiful. I just left about. I left about two years, briefly left the country, came back. And when I came back, I came back to you. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. My, my, my cousin, my cousin once lived there for some time. Uh, Sorry? Come again. My cousin, what? my cousin okay. once lived there for some okay. time. Um, for me, um, since I... Went to the West, Ilaro, then Lagos. Uh, I, I see if I if I come back to live in Nigeria, I most likely go back to my home, Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's Lagosians feel that way all the time. Yes, I know. Even even here in Oyo, there's that subtle feeling that once you get to a particular level at like what you are doing, you must leave the place. Really? Um, I don't know yet if they are right or they are wrong. I'm here to prove them either right or wrong. Okay. But it's, I know that from Uyo, we are, our, the things we are doing is going beyond the borders of the city. Yeah, we are I mean, hey, with, with technology, you can be anywhere and be any, anywhere else, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Now, Thank you. David, uh, we have been talking, but my audience don't know who I'm talking to. Okay, so please, please introduce yourself to my audience. Let them know what, who you are and what you do. Uh, okay, great. So my name is David Ogunshola. Um, I introduce myself as an innovation catalyst. It's not a regular job description or a regular title that people get to know, but some really what I do is I inspire creativity and innovation and I choose to focus among younger people. When I say younger people, my niche is five to 16 years old. Wow. So I consider myself a children's innovation catalyst. Um, of course, that, that, that menu has a lot of ingredients. So my first degree was in computer science. Okay. Um, I started out as a software developer, worked for a couple of software companies. Then I went to study organizational leadership. I have a master of arts in organizational leadership. And okay. then I went to study education. I have a master's of education. Interesting. In so... Um, I combine, and then I've worked in different places. My first job at Deloitte, I mean, I've moved around places, worked in different industries, in consulting, in education, in retail. And um, right now, so I'm both, a, I'm a tech founder, I'm an education entrepreneur, and I'm a STEM educator. My vision is how do I help young people to get the right ingredients early so that they can begin to contribute to their communities and to their nation. Africa is a very young continent. Yes. 50% of this country is below nine, of the continent is below 19. Yeah. 40% below 14. If we will prosper as a continent, if we will prosper as a, as, as a people, the black race, we need to focus on that younger generation. 50% below 19 is, seems to be an ignored demographic. Most of our trainings, education, entrepreneurship programs, ev grants, everything seems to be focused on adults. Whereas half the continent are below. Are below. Yeah. So we are going down to meet them there. That's what I do. Wow. See, uh, see, I wanted to ask you 
what you meant when you you introduced yourself as a software engineer who became a teacher. Okay. Now I understand it. Okay. <laughs> I I understand it, but I still I want you to dig it into it a little bit for the benefit of my audience. Now, why did you decide to get a master's in education? Because normally somebody who is already a teacher, okay, will now see software engineers and say, wow, I want to be that. But you went the other way, okay? You yeah. were a software engineer and then you saw teaching and say, I want to be that. See, yeah. I come from a, how, a home, my parents were teachers, okay? My mother retired as a headmistress, okay? So I know what teachers, educator, educators do, okay? And I admire, I, I admire that, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, okay? Mm. But you, from a software engineer to teacher, please tell us, yeah, how did it happen? Hmm? Okay, so um, I got married in 2013, and my wife is a teacher. Just so we, my wife studied early childhood education, first degree, master's degree, PhD. Wow. So she has three degrees. She, she went all out to be a teacher. When we got married, her passion was to be a teacher. Mine was just to be a tech guy. So I was a tech founder. So when we got married in 2013, both of us started our companies. She started a daycare center that eventually was becoming a school. I launched a software company. And so all I was doing was just providing support to our school. Though we, we founded the school together. In fact, we wrote the business plan before we even got married. Okay. We had no one to do. So yes, we were, we we're both founders of the school technically on paper, but yeah. it was her brainchild, her idea. Mine was just support her with technology, strategy, whatever technology can do to give her wings. One day I was working in my office and I stumbled on an information that shattered my the rest of my life. <laughs> and that it was 2017. Five countries in the world had passed legislation that computer programming should be taught from elementary school. Mm. And I was like, hold on, wait a minute, what is this? This is not, they are not suggesting it, it's now legislation. Meaning in those five countries, basic literacy is reading, writing, coding. And I'm like, hold on. I learned to code in the university. These kids are learning to code in primary too. How do we stand a chance to compete? And now I'm thinking, we're running a school. If we're preparing our children, our students to compete globally, who are, what, start, what chance will they stand if they're going to meet kids? They're going to learn in, in university what yeah. these kids learn in primary school. I realized that, no, if we're going to face the future, we have to focus on these kids early. So that was my pull into the education system. Wow. And I decided to go start teaching. I said, okay, I'm going to start teaching these kids to code. And initially, it was like a side gig. You know what? Just a hobby. Let me just go and teach these kids in my spare time. And I began teaching them, began exploring, looking for resources. I just followed the trail, what's available. And as I continued, I realized there was a major gap. No books, no resources. And I began to order books. I started buying books from the U.S. on Amazon, expensive books, just so that I could teach, this, I could teach kids. But I couldn't find a curriculum. Then I began to travel, just curiosity. Went around the continent, went to Nairobi, went to Kigali. What are you guys, what's available anywhere? And I discovered there was not even an existing curriculum for children on the continent. Wow. And I'm like, hold on, somebody has to respond to this problem. Yeah. How are you going to compete? And that's, I mean, for me, so it's just been a thrill. And I began to build, as I was teaching, I was practically building my curriculum. Each day I'm going to class, I sit down, what do I teach these kids? Build a lesson. And that's when I began to take lessons on teaching. How do I teach? How do I connect with children at five years, six years, seven years? How do I break down computer programming concepts for seven-year-olds, loops, algorithms, conditionals? And I began to study, began to go for conferences. And I began, I realized I was already writing a curriculum. <laughs> then I began to ask myself, who's going to, I mean, I, my curriculum needed legitimacy. Mm. Even if I know what I have written, even if I know what I have built, People are going to ask, who is this guy? Who qualified him to write a text that we should listen to? <laughs> I had to go back to school. Oh. So it's been one. So, I mean, right now, I, I early coding for kids. Um, I am yet to see another one. I mean, I, I don't want to say he's the first in Africa, 
But I, I, I want to be proven wrong. I've, I've not yet seen another curriculum that teaches children to code. I've written five textbooks so yeah. far, working on six and seven right now, that teach wow. children to code from age five. Wow. And schools are school. When I go to show them to schools and they're like, where have you been all these years? <laughs> <laughs> because it's been a need wow. that nobody had had already. So all software guys, I mean, I went for a conference once. There was a STEM conference organized by MIT. Mm. Um, and for that first year, Scratch, MIT, Scratch, MIT guys, they also built yeah. Scratch, organized this conference in Nairobi. And I said, okay, let me go and see. I'm in Uyo. I'm sure that there are guys in Lagos who are thriving at these guys in the big cities. But let me go to an Africa country, a global conference, and let me see who are the big players in the industry. Mm. And I got there again. I was the only Nigerian in that conference. Wait, then wait, I realized, wait, hold, oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. That conference is where? Nairobi. Nairobi. For the first in, time, hold on, no, hold on, Africa. No, hold on, no. in Africa. Yeah. Eh? In Africa. And the, and the biggest country in Africa, don't, they don't even smell the idea of coming there. At least, if they didn't, we didn't have the knowledge to create that environment and invite people to us. Yeah? Yet we didn't have the sense to say, okay, they have created it. They have, let's go and see. Okay. Now, let, let, let me put it in mm. context for you. A week before that, Google held a conference in Nairobi, yeah. a developer conference in Nairobi. Nigerians filled up the place. Okay, okay. One week after another conference, what I just saw was that Nigeria is not lagging behind the technology. Yes. We were just not seeing the opportunity in education. Yeah, they, they don't see the opportunity for young people. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if you're talking about regular tech, if Facebook runs a conference now, from any, any tech company that puts a conference globally, I can promise you Nigerian developers will be leading the crew there. Mm. But in this case, we were not even on the list. I got there and I was amazed that what, okay, to be fair, one other guy came in from the US of Nigerian origin. Mm. He came as a resource person. I was also shocked. He said, where are my people? I was the only mm. one. Mm. 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 And in fact, the shocking part for most of the attendees were asking me, so who sponsored you? I said, sponsored me. I paid my way here. Nobody sponsored me. But like, no, it's people. So people had grants. People had universities. South Africans had universities sending them. People from other companies. I came on my own ticket. I paid everything from my pocket to go there. That was when I really realized that somebody had to stand up to take on this challenge. Yeah. And I figured I need to divert my entire tech career towards education. Wow. That's how I decided to become a teacher. Wow. Man, David, uh, I, I don't say this, no, I, I, I don't use this language, yeah? but I will use it for you. Yeah? God will bless you. Hmm? Amen. <laughs> wow. You see, we talk about developing Africa. We talk about it a lot, a lot. But all we do is talk because, mm. no, you just said it, 50% of Africans are below the age of 20. 19, actually. The media yeah, age yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm being generous, okay? Okay. By, by giving them that uh, One knowledge, extra. okay? But we don't think that education is a, is a key and we need to catch them young. Yeah. See, that, that's why, that's why, unfortunately, how old are those people who cross the Sahara Desert, this um, Mediterranean Sea, to come to Europe? They are early 20s. Yeah. The majority of them are early 20s. Why? Because they don't see any future where they are. True. True. They don't see any future where they are because unfortunately our society has not prioritized the people 
we should prioritize. Exactly. Yeah. Now you have been teaching technology coding to young people. Now I'm all for teaching the whole of STEM. Okay. Okay. Now, like you said, any tech conference you see a lot of Nigerians and Africans. Okay. Yeah. So we are we have been getting into technology yeah but for me for me in the end of the day the next technologies that will come will come from people who study and deal with the fundamentals of science okay okay basic science either in medicine, people who study and research biology, mm -hmm. microbiology, mm -hmm. biochemistry, and they're the ones that, that are going to create, that are going to uh, come up with that theories on which they will build a technology. Even, even physic physicists, chemists, are the ones that will bet the the knowledge that would develop into a tech a, a technology now what are we doing in, in those spaces without yeah. without getting into the the nitty-gritty the foundation will in 20 years when the whole of africa is uh, booming with tech yeah. yeah, we'll still be going to the, to to the West or China, asking them to uh, what's it called now? Give us uh, access to some tools because we're not into that research. Yeah, I mean, I think you you nailed the question very well. When I started my company. Or my second company, I, used, I, used, I initially called it Code Academy. Mm. But after a while, I changed the name from Code Academy okay. to STEM Academy. Okay. And it's what you are talking about. Okay. Yeah. That shift that lets people know that it's not all about coding. Okay. On my early coding book, on the first level of my book, on book, the book one, the first page, I have a quotation there that says, first, solve the problem. Okay. Write the code. Okay. Technology itself, and this is what I tell all my kids and my students, technology is only an enabler of industries. Exactly. Technology in itself is not an industry. Mm -mm. Technology has to combine with something real for it to make sense. There was finance. We brought in tech and created fintech. Yeah. There was education. We brought in tech and created edtech. There was okay. health. Technology came and created health tech. Okay. There's so transportation, agriculture, Technology in itself, for it to make sense, it's an enabler. Time, it's yeah. an enabler. It yeah. only comes to an industry and revolutionizes how that industry functions. Yeah. Okay. So, technology guys will be useless if there are no industry experts. Okay. That is, I mean, that I, I that is something I say all the time. If you yeah. go to my blog, you will see me saying that it's an it's not it's an enabler of industries. And so, we need to get back, and which is why. Which is why STEM, if you look at when I talk about STEM, I'm planning to do a webinar very soon. If when I talk about STEM, when you mention STEM to many educators, they just think about technology Tech. and coding. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I'm trying to make them understand, demystify this thing. It's not yeah. the whole idea of STEM is um is about shaping the way students think. think. Students learn. Yeah. STEM is a paradigm that's applicable in anything. Yeah. You are teaching social studies, you are teaching mathematics, you are teaching integrated science. You bring in STEM methodologies so that students learn to think like creators, like problem solvers, like innovators, and they're able to apply a way of thinking. Yeah. I mean, I think a certification in the US. The, the scientific STEM. method, that's it. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. There's a certification I took in the US. It's called the NCSD, the National Certificate for STEM Teaching. Okay. That certification scattered my brain <laughs> when i finish that education we run a school and our school is considered one of the most innovative schools in town here in new york where we live when i as i was taking that certification 
I was just seeing plenty of rubbish that we're doing in our school. <laughs> I think I told my wife, I'm coming to dismantle what we are doing and reassemble it again. So that through the teaching of everyday subjects, mm. we're able to help students think and become. So right now, when I do STEM seminars, I think yes. it's for, not for coding, it's for every teacher. Yeah. Because we need to bring that methodology. And students need to now go into their industries. Yeah. Come with the tool of technology. So that when you are doing science and you see, so you can um, you can use technology to enable science. Yeah. You can use technology to enable whatever it is you are doing. And I tell professionals, this, the, the, the value of industry experts, we never, when they say tech will replace AI will replace it. AI builds on, on an intelligence. AI builds on existing. So domain experts have to be there. We can't stop studying medicine and microbiology and, and, um, and all of and engineering. We just need to give it the wings of technology, which yeah. is why those fundamentals, we cannot ignore them. We need math teachers. We need yeah. science teachers. We need chemistry teachers. All of them, very, very important. If, if technology will have any value in the future, those other fields must still be as important yeah. as technology is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, uh, our people need to realize that. Uh, yes, I don't know what percentage of our students to learn coding, but the most important thing, they still need to learn maths. They still need to learn chemistry, physics, biology. Yeah. You know, my yeah. advocacy is that coding should be taught as a subject in schools. Mm. I still think that every child should know the fundamentals of coding. Okay. There's a way it makes your mind work. Mm. There's a way learning to code makes you think at a particular level, which, I mean, even my students, once they start learning to code, their performance in other subjects begin to change. Wow. Yes. Because you're able to think in procedures, you're able to think in, yeah, in, in, exactly. in algorithms. It, it makes your mind function at a different level. And then knowing what is possible, what, for example, I'm, 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 many people consider me a consultant. They still invite me to come to many, I, I sit on many committees and boards here and there. And I've realized that what makes me valuable is just me. Is the way you think. That, that computational thinking. Yeah. So we have a problem. <laughs> and this problem is in is in ophthalmology. I'm currently consulting for an ophthalmology team. They are all okay. professors and doctors in eye, in eye medicine. Okay. But I'm on that team. And we're thinking, how do they test people that they call? They have very, I don't understand the complex thing they have. Yeah. But we need to bring that thinking to the system so that, no, this is what we should do next. Next. What makes me bring, think like that is the fact that I understand how computers think. Yeah. yeah. So I think programming should be taught in all schools. That's why I'm creating textbooks at the level that schools can integrate and I've built teacher training courses. I've built a certification courses for teachers so that when you buy the textbook, teachers can get trained yeah. to use textbooks because I can't teach in all schools. Of course not. So yeah. I, I understand it's an entire ecosystem that I've created. When the books come, there'll be need for teachers. There'll be need for lots and lots and lots more. So it's one thing that is just leading to the other and I'm just following mm. the trail, like I said at the mm. beginning. Wow. Wow. Thank you for the, the great work you're doing. You know. We just you know, beat everybody does his part. We yeah, just find yeah, part and we contribute it. Yeah. Now, I well, I, let me tell my audience. I met you on LinkedIn. No, I met you first through a a YouTube video that was shared somewhere, and then I found your name and called you. Okay, wow. I got in touch with, with you on LinkedIn. Wow. So I've been, I've been following you wow. and uh, last Sunday, last Sunday, you posted something about uh, innovation, yeah. which I, I want to read, okay, to my audience. And then I will ask you a question about okay. that. Uh, where do you, I have it somewhere? Let me share. Now, can, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, okay. So your post, this is your post uh, on so last Sunday. Okay, it says, uh, if wishes are horses, beggars will ride. We cannot wish Africa into prosperity. We cannot wish per prosper poverty 
unemployment, unproductivity, corruption, and bad leadership away. We need something practical to replace them with, okay? And we all agree that Africa is lacking enough of innovation to help her maximize her potential. The kind of innovation we need in Africa is, I call, it's what I call innovation at scale. The scale of innovation we need is a kind where on every street on the continent, someone is seeing a problem and converting it into an opportunity without expecting an uh, imaginative character called the government to fix every problem that exists. But innovation does not come from the sky. Neither does it happen in a vacuum. There is a recipe and a process to it. In this article, I share I share three core ingredients that, that are necessary for innovation to be, to de, to be developed. And, to sh and I hope we are able to ask the right questions that will lead us to the right answers. Now, that's the post. And then, of course, at the end of that is the article. I, I, I read it. Now, yeah. the question... Uh, I want to ask you is this. Just like that first video I watched, okay? okay. You, you sound like uh, a little bit like a, a, libert, a libertarian. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one thing. See, I guess, uh, I guess every, every, Every serious person has some of some of that. Okay, we believe that we are in charge of our lives at one time. Okay. Anyway, why do you think we we tell ourselves uh, these fantastic stories rather than deal with facts? Of on on the ground when we we encounter difficulties okay for example we have a lot of uh, churches in nigeria okay and our people pray monday no sunday they do to they do evening service on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Huh? Yet they they still have the same problem, and they they haven't. It hasn't occurred to them that I can fix some of this. Yeah. God, God, his own, have, has his own to to fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, I believe God is waiting for you to take the right steps. Why do you think we have this, this behavior? Because for me, until we, we start doing the right thing, we'll be in the same space in another yeah. 30 years. Exactly. Yes. Um, I think you, you are very right. There is a comment I made in that my post, my post where I said the kind of innovation we need is what I call innovation at scale. At scale, yes. There are innovators in Africa. Mm. There are people who are breaking the ground with innovation, but we are few. Let me use the word because I, I consider myself in that category. Okay. Because people who see a problem and say, I will fix this. Yes. I saw a problem in education space and said, I'm going to yeah, fix it. And you're fixing it. And I'm fixing it. Yeah. And there are people like that in, in different industries. The problem is we are very few. Which is why I said the innovation that will take Africa out of poverty is innovation at scale. Where P 
people are able to do that stuff at every level. So there is a problem in a neighborhood and some boys decide we're going to fix this problem and convert it into a solution. In my academy, the STEM academy I run, our vision is very simple. Each of our students should launch their first startup before 16. Wow. It's on our website. If you go there, that's the first thing you see on the website. Early yes, I, I saw it. That is, the, you will see that. I mean, it's on our t-shirt. It's everywhere. 16, before 16, they should launch their first startup and start solving a problem and start contributing to the economy. But you see, it's good to, to say these things. But like I said, why, why I was able to bring out the article, why I brought out three ingredients for innovation is that while we are saying people should become innovative, if those three things are not available at scale, mm. we cannot have innovation at scale. at scale. Number one of them I talked about was expertise. Yes. Which you were coming from earlier. You just talked about biology, medicine, and everything. You cannot innovate without being an expert at something. Of, 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 of that field, yeah. Yes. So when people have not built expertise at something, and I consider education to be our ground zero. Ekene, the education we have, not just in Nigeria, in Africa, is an education system that promotes memorization and remembering yeah. above thinking and creativity. Yeah. Once you can remember what, in fact, the goal of people going to school is to remember. Nine major planets, I come, the Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, major I don't, I don't know. They are lent. I mean, Today. what, of what <laughs> value is that information to you? Why, would, why do I need to know how long River Nine is? It's available on Google in one second. Things that have no value. And so we, we have that. And so education, I talk about expertise, one. The reason why a lot of people have the time to be, I used to drive to my office Thursday morning. I would see people in church on the road praying Thursday morning. I'm like, we say we are not a productive country. See the people that should be producing gathered on that roof. I am a Christian. I believe in worship. I believe in going to church, but not on a Monday morning for crying out loud. We need to be productive. Work, work. But you see, people cannot produce when they don't even know what to do. Why is unemployment very high in Nigeria? It's because of our education system. People go out there. I employ lots of people. In my businesses, cumulative, the school, or did I run? But I think I employ directly about 140 people. Wow. Direct employment. Wow. That's, that's huge, man. Congrats, now, man. Wow. <laughs> now, I, I wish I could do more. But sometimes, even at that, with the growth we're having, I interview lots of people. I see lots of applications. And I just wonder, people come to me and I ask them one or two questions. And you see the problem, they are not thinking. Thinking, yeah. They are not thinking. Which is why number two on that thing is called creative thinking skills. Number one, expertise. Number two, creative thinking. Yes, you studied chemistry. You can do periodic table and hydrocarbons and how all of those chemicals combine. Excuse me. Creatively think of how that thing can solve a problem. We have a water problem, water pollution. How does your chemistry convert to water pollution? Somebody studied engineering and we don't have light in the house and he cannot even figure, he doesn't understand how light, electricity moves from one source to the other. So why is it this, why, which is why I said, I hope that we get to the point where we start asking the right questions so that we have the right answers. There is something fundamentally wrong with the education we get. Until we address that, we will not get to that point. Creativity, expertise, and then when people have the expertise, are they even willing? Now we have creative people who are who are thinking, who are experts. The lack of motivation is what has caused what we call Jaguar movement. Mm. They are going because they they don't have the will to stay back and build anything. Let me tell you the truth. I've had multiple opportunities to leave this country. Multiple. My wife is a professional. My wife has job offers from universities in the U.S. In fact, one of them was undated. They undated the offer and sent that to her. When you make up your mind, come. I have the email, the, the letter with me. So, if you see, for me and for us, everybody building here, there is a motivation factor. Something is pushing us. Something yeah. is. And so when that motivation is not there, even those who are experts, who think creatively, they'll simply carry themselves to go elsewhere. Yeah. Now, that motivation... You don't want to know how hard building a business. No, see, I, 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 I know, I know. Uh, 
Yeah, I've, 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 I've not done it, but I have a lot of, a lot of people doing it. Okay, very good, good friends of mine. And I know, I know how hard it is, okay? But see, I told you I had a stroke 12 yeah, years ago. Uh, I came to this country in 07. Uh, and I will tell you, the reason I, I left Nigeria was not because I didn't have a job. I had a very good job, but I left because of police, unfortunately. So police. I, oh yeah. Yeah, see, I have been arrested from from the first time I started driving at 16. Uh, I get arrested oh, very often, okay, for for stupid things, asking me paper, and my papers are always correct because my father is a teacher. He knows the kind of thing, things they do. Anyway, I left the country for the reason I, I left because by, the, by, by that time, I had my first two kids and, and I said to myself the way I interact with police one day they will just shoot me I don't uh -huh. want that to happen so I left anyway within two years being in this country working in the city and Canary Wharf the financial se sector of this country I, I found I find myself in a, in a position to say to myself why am I here these people I'm working with are not as, most of them are not as smart as, as the people I used to work in, in Nigeria. Okay. okay. And this country was built by people like me. Okay. People like me need to go back to my, to Nigeria. Now, uh, myself and some friends, created, uh, founded uh, what we call uh, Professionals for Africa. You can still see the, the group on, on, link, on LinkedIn. We have okay. over, over nearly a thousand members in that, in that group on LinkedIn. Okay, I'm the, I'm the owner of the, pay, of the page. Okay. Anyway, we're hosting quarterly events. Okay, and people from all over UK, sometimes in, from the rest of, uh, of Europe, Come to the event. It was big. Anyway, and I, I was telling my friend, my friends, we need to go back to Africa. We need to go back to Africa. Unfortunately, I had a stroke. The main guy who started the the group, the group, and he invited me and, and others. He has gone back to Africa. Okay, okay. he's a friend of my uh, Jubil Anakele. He was the the MG of uh, Zenith Capital. Now okay. he now he owns his own uh, firm, uh, Iron 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 Capital. Now and then others have gone back. Okay, but the point I'm making is this: Yes, we need to do the work. Most of us do not want to do the work. Okay. Uh, I won't blame those who are not, those, I, won't, I won't say people don't want to do the work. Motivation is a very important element. Yes. To, you know, yes. When I say motivation, there are many. I'm mean, like I said in the article, motivation could be in, intrinsic or extrinsic, meaning from internally, something drives yeah. you from within or something outside motivates you. Sometimes the inner motivation is what gives you the strength to face the everything outside trying to stop you. Yeah. See, there are people that, thrive on Africa the way it is. Some people yeah. want Africa to remain the way it is. And they are doing everything to stop every possible innovation. But let me tell you something. We, 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 like you said, those countries were built by people. Yeah. I've, read, I, I've read books about how economies develop. Yeah. Um, America's development was not driven by government. No. It was driven <laughs> by individuals. Yeah. And many of these individuals they they face because when i read when i if you see how america was 200 years ago is worse than where africa is today oh yeah the corruption in america the underdevelopment is we are way better than what they were so if they could come out of that to become what they are today i know there's hope for africa but when i, I began to study the people i mean let me give a, a popular example henry ford mm. henry ford wanted to build cars when there were no roads yeah 
And he did something that in today's business, they call it vertical integration. So to build cars, he had to first start constructing roads. There was no iron to build the cars. He made a steel factory. There was no rubber, so time he planted a rubber, rubber plantation. He practically was doing everything that needed to be done. So I need to make tires, no supply of materials. What do I do? Rubber. He planted his rubber plantation to generate raw materials to make tires for the cars. There were no enough steel to make the cars. He started a steel smell. I mean, if you go and read how crazy it was. So when I read stories like that, for me, those are some places where motivation comes. Mm. When I started working on my book, I pitched to a lot of people that we need to create a curriculum, for example, for, for, for coding for kids in Africa. Nobody was seeing it. Yeah. So I, I, I said, it's hard. It's I hard. Scripts, and I started looking for illustrators. I many times on Twitter, everywhere, I need illustrators, educational illustrators, who can illustrate. People will come to my DM and I send them one sample lesson. This is what I want to design. Oh, is it book for children for coding? No, not this kind of design. I thought <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I found a company in Rwanda that understood what I wanted. They gave wow. me a sample. They killed it. In fact, I flew to Kigali to meet with them. Met with them, we discussed. I mean, they got the, the picture I had in mind because yeah. I thought I was going to do something for Africa. When they gave me their bill, <laughs> it was it was fifty dollars a page for design. Wow! So a fifty page book was two thousand five hundred dollars. I was trying to publish five books at a start. That's twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Where do I get that kind of money from? I started writing in people I knew were investing. I, I wrote a couple of investors. Many of them didn't even reply because I'm sure they were wondering what is what book here? We're investing in tech startup. This guy is making book. How is book a tech startup? Can I shock you? Ooh. I shut down what I was doing. I illustrated those books myself. All of I just told myself, I'm going to cut down three hours of sleep every night. And in six months, I'll be done with this. That's what I did. Today, the books are out. I mean, I have, I have, I have, you are okay. Wow. These, these are my books. Ooh. I mean, the books today, when people see them, they are amazed. They wonder who, who is the illustrator behind the books. I mean, before I went into coding, I was I, I used graphic design as side hustle in university to chop food. You understand? <laughs> so I had the skill on the side. I simply had become a tech guy. I led graphic design on the side. I mean, I used to design certificates, flyers to, to eat, to, 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 to get money on campus. So I simply said, and now, you know, that's at a point I was thinking, am I really making sense? If nobody is seeing the, the future in this thing, Nobody's willing to put money behind it. So I, I went, even when the books came out, I'm like, now I need to print the books. I have design. Printers are not going to print for me on credit. Yeah. I needed millions of Naira to print these books. Nobody was with I had to tackle all of my friends. You have any money in your account, just send it to me. You know me. You, I'm credible. Borrow me the money. That's how these books came out. Now, tell me the truth. Why would I not give up? Yeah. Why would why would why would somebody well, go through? Let, let me struggle? let me tell you why you didn't you didn't give up. You have seen people like you. You get build, it. people like you build the build greatest, roads for cars. The greatest economy in the world. God bless you. That's the place of motivation yeah. for innovation. When I said expertise, creative thinking, motivation, without those three ingredients, we can't have innovation at scale. If people on the streets will go out and start thinking, they must have the capacity to think. They must have something to think around and expertise. And they must have a reason to stay, at, to stay at it. How do we generate those things? Those are the right questions. Yeah. When we start asking the right questions, the right answers will come out. Good. I like, I like what you said. When we start asking the right questions, okay, that's, that's I would say, one of the biggest uh challenge we have in Africa. Okay. I I follow a few pages Afri uh, African focus pages on uh, Facebook and yeah. LinkedIn. Okay. Yes uh young Africans want to talk okay but unfortunately, we have this issue. Uh, they don't want to think and ask questions. And when somebody asks questions that people consider difficult, 
or maybe controversial. Yeah. Instead of them to say, okay, let's step back and think about this. And maybe banter, okay? They rather get annoyed. They hang the person. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And that's that's not going to help us. See, we need to start asking questions. Asking questions and and start providing some some ideas. Okay? And bat the ideas back and forth. That's it. Uh, the 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 enlightenment, which built the West, okay, was just about ideas. Yeah. See, philosophy is thinking about things and yeah. think about it and and ask more think, questions. Yeah, ask questions, and share your own. The other the answer. Comes, Let's keep talking about this, this, this. That's it. Yeah. But we don't want to do that. See. Didn't see my this this podcast is called Think Big for Africa. Mm. There's a reason why I use the word think because most of the key the younger younger people I I I first started talking to were not thinking. So that that is a big problem. Okay, and yeah. I won't I won't blame them. They they they, they have not been taught how to think they've never had a reason to think okay see so that's that's what i want that's what i think i can contribute to see if you see my my whatever on on on, on social media i don't really talk tell anybody what to do okay if i read your your post what i normally do is ask you one question Another question, another question, another question. Mm. Okay. And that's that's how I started. Okay. But unfortunately, uh, after after a while, the owner of the page will boot me out <laughs> just for asking questions. Okay. So mm. we need we need to to make to make us I don't know what what we need to make ourselves. A little bit more resilient when somebody asks you questions that annoy you. Yeah. Okay. See, when somebody asks me questions that annoy me, yes, I'm annoyed. I'm human. Okay. But what I do is that I just leave it. I don't answer. See, people think by the once somebody asks you a question, you need to quickly answer it. No. Leave it. Yeah. Go and do some other things. Okay? That's right. When you are doing other things, the the question will, will be playing your head. Yeah. yeah. And then you you have time to think about it and you come up with answers. Or it might help you think through it and ask you yourself some other questions. In fact, in my training as a, as a teacher, while I was trying to become a STEM educator, Knowing how to ask questions is one of the great skills yeah. that teachers need to learn. And it's one of the things that I even saw when I say that I was seeing many of the rubbish we're doing in our school. The ability to ask questions. In fact, my, my training taught me that your quest, when you even ask questions, most teachers are focused on the answer. Yeah. The goal of questioning is not even answering. It is something to trigger. So there's something called investigable questions. Okay. So when you're crafting questions, you ask a question, am I going to tell you that is not an investigable question? This question does not cause a child to think. Think. And so these kind of questions should not even come up in your class at all. You don't, you don't want a yes or no answer. You don't want a yes or no answer. Yes, exactly. And even when you have a yes or no answer, follow up and ask, why is it yes? Why is it, why is it so? Make sure there's a thinking. So that thinking thing, but... Uh, until if we, if we don't solve that problem, well, uh, we are we are not a thinking continent. That is well, it. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's continent. a problem. It's a, it's problem. a big problem, especially because of the of social media. See, social media has done well because it has allowed us to to be all together in a space. Okay, but it has also 
started this 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 cultural thing about canceling people, blocking people. Yeah. Okay. When they say something you don't like, that you don't like or you don't agree with, you just yeah. pick them so, out. Yeah. Mm. Now, uh, of all of this, education is still our ground zero. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> see, from edu- education is everything. Yeah. Education is everything. See, if we don't fix the, see, almost every problem we have, uh, have a, a, a solution rooted, rooted in education. Yeah. Almost every problem we have in Af- major pro- problem we have in, in Africa, the solutions are rooted in something we need to learn. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, the thing we struggle with is because we haven't learned the fundamentals of those things. Yeah, you know, I agree. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, leave all this term thing. Okay, I want to. I want to. Also, I, I want you to tell my audience. Uh, give them. See, I I I, li- I like to read. Okay, I yeah. I like I like to read. And if you see my library, I have shelf and books everywhere. Yeah. Uh, our people don't like to read. Okay. Mm. We have problem with that. Uh, and and like I like like I just said, uh, many of the pro- uh, problems we have, uh, the solutions are rooted in educa- education. Yeah. And uh, education, you can. You can't be educating yourself. You need to read something. Okay. So, so tell my audience, give my audience at least five books that uh, they should get in their, in their library. Okay. And uh, I hope uh, while they're putting it in the library, they open it and read it. Ha 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 ha. That's another thing. Very important. <laughs> you buy a book, you don't need to read a book. Actually, I have books I've not read too. So oh, me too, me too. I, I I don't see a good book and pass. I just buy it. <laughs> I, will, I will eventually read it. So I just yeah, buy, that's I it. it. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, book recommendations. There are a couple of books that have okay. that changed the way I think. Okay. Um, and I'm so I'm assuming that the audience falls in different categories. Yeah. So I'm probably gonna put the books in different categories. Okay. Now, for young people who are concerned and are saying, um. Okay, or maybe I should maybe I should start with entrepreneurs first. Then I come okay. back to young. So okay, you are you are in business. You are an entrepreneur, innovating, trying to do something. One of the books that has changed the way I think is Four Disciplines of Execution. Mm, I, yeah. I've never heard of, of that. By, of that, by Chris McChesney. Everybody knows what to do. How to do it is the issue. Ooh. Okay. So, so we have a problem. Say, okay, if we do this, we do this, we solve the problem. No problem. Let's get it done. Execution has been the problem. And so, um, fantastic ideas all over the place. In fact, ideas are two for 10 cobo. If there's <laughs> execution. So for entrepreneurs, you need that book. It's for me, it's each of my managers in my office reads that book. Once I make you a manager to head a team, you have to yeah. read four disciplines just, of execution. Just like my, my former boss, uh, when I worked with him as, as a, an assistant, he made me order this book called execution okay and yes. I, I i also got a, a copy you know and he got those books for every one of its managers you know yeah That's it's execution you are right <laughs> yeah i mean execution, if, you want, yeah. If, you, if your company will get stuff done you must be an execute an executing company yeah so i recommend that for entrepreneurs there's one other book i recommend for anybody now entrepreneurs professionals anybody it's called deep work okay deep work by carl newport mm. In a very, if you're going to produce high level intellectual work in a very distracted world, you must have the ability to do something called deep work. The world is too noisy. Social media, twing, twing, your phone is buzzing here and there. You must have that ability to, to find a way to do what you call deep work. Because our, our brain, the main idea is our brain functions like a speedometer. You start from zero and you are accelerating to, let's say, 80, 90, 100. The quality of work you do at 100. It's not the same as the quality of work you do at 40. Mm. But your brain can't get to 100 if it's not focused on accelerating. Okay. High cognitive capacity. 
And once a distraction comes in, a notification on your phone comes in, and you just say, let me peep at it, it goes back to zero. Yeah. And you have to start again. And it takes the same amount of time it took you to get to 100 cap brain capacity that you to take you to get back there. So you can't just go and come back and continue that level of work. So most times people do very shabby work because they work at very low cognitive levels. Mm, mm, they never get their brain mm. to a very high intensity level. An article you write at a level, at a hundred brain capacity level and a 20 capacity, they can't be the same yeah. because your brain must be functional. So deep work by Carl Newport. Um, professionals, there's a book I love professionals to read called David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. Okay. I, the, I wanted to order, I, ha, I have a, I have a, uh... About three of his books, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, basically talking about misfits and underdogs, how to yeah. fight giants, the advantages and disadvantages. I mean, it changed the way I saw a lot of things. And so, David and Goliath, fantastic. For parents, educators, okay. there, is, there is a particular book. I mean, two books by the same author. One is called Global Achievement Gaps. Okay. And the second is called Raising Innovators, both books by Tony Wagner. Okay, yeah. I mean, those two books, The Global Achievement Gaps and The Raising Innovators. Every parent should read that book. Every educator, when we hire in the school, top level leadership in our school, you must read that book. Okay. You must read. I mean, at least Raising, raising Innovators, you have to read that book. Now, for those young people who are wondering, these are all high level books. Most young people come and say, I don't know what to do. I don't have a job. I don't have, I can't get this. Uh, Parable of Dollars by Sam Adeyemi. Ooh, ooh, I recommend okay, that for young okay, people. Okay. Okay. Parable of Dollars, Sam Adeyemi. Wow. And then there's one book I'll recommend for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's called The Prosperity Paradox. Have I not read it? Clayton Christensen. Clayton Christensen is a Harvard, Harvard Business School professor. The, par oh. the Prosperity Paradox. It's top title is how innovation can lift nations out of poverty. No, let, let me check my, my uh, audible. I, audible. Recommend, I because, recommend that book. No. No, I, I I didn't get it. I I I saw it, but I didn't get it. Now yes. I will get it. I will yes. get it. Thank you, thank you for that. Prosperity paradox. I recommend. I mean, that book is going to. You're going to. I mean, it's just get the book. It's 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 a it's a game changer. Yeah, I I, I, will, I will get thinkers, it. I'll get it. For thinkers who are interested in Africa, that mm. is a book I yeah. recommend. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Now, so let me let me ask you. See, we have, we have been talking about so many different things, okay? Yeah. What advice would you have for young Africans? You know, because, see, I want them and you, you want them to add value to their environment, their society, okay? Mm -hmm. So many of them will say, I don't have the money. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this. But... Yes, irrespective of their, the difficulties in their situations, yeah. they can still add value. So what would you, what would you advise? Two, uh, two pieces of advice for every young African. Number one, nobody's coming to save us. Oh. <laughs> we have to take our destiny in our hands. <laughs> If we are waiting for somebody somewhere, remember when I said the age of the average African is 19, mm. the average African leader is 63. Yeah. Okay. So okay. our, the, our, nobody in the truth is that our leaders are not thinking about us. Okay. There's nobody who is making decisions somewhere with you in mind. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're on your own. <laughs> oh, use that word. So we are, we are on our own. Let me use the word. We, we are on our own. Yeah. And so, what we need to do is to create opportunities for ourselves. Okay. Collaborate among ourselves. Okay. And decide that we're going to make things work. Okay. Now, it's going to require a lot of ruggedity and doggedness. Yeah. But don't you, 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 you don't have a disadvantage. You can find a way around everything. Good example I'll give you. Schools are calling me across the country saying, we love your books. We don't have teachers. Can you give us teachers who will teach coding in our schools? And I'm here saying, young people, come and take training. If I train you, I will connect you to jobs. They are not seeing it. Okay. They're asking me, will I pay them for the training? 
Okay. I'm training you for free and I'm okay. going to give you a job afterwards. So okay. what I'm saying is take opportunities when they come. That's the last thing for every young person. See an opportunity, take it. Okay. See, I will give you one, one small example. On LinkedIn, there is a young man who messaged me. He asked me to connect with him. I agree, I did. Okay. And uh, the first message was to ask me for money. Oh. I, I don't know this young man. There you go. I don't know him from anywhere. <laughs> and the first thing he asked me is for money. Now, I could have ignored him, but I didn't. I asked him some questions, you know, trying to lead him in a direction to say, okay, I'm asking this, this man, he said he's, he's a student in a university and he needed money for it. Okay. For me, I would have thought, what can I do for this man that he may eventually pay me for? Yeah. Okay. I'm saying this, if if he, he listens to this uh, podcast, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe now he, 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 he... See, last few weeks, after, after a while, I stopped responding to him, okay? He sent a lot of... I didn't respond. And the last few, few weeks again, he has come back asking me some more other questions why I just didn't respond. But a young man could have offered to give me some value. It, does, it doesn't matter what amount of value. But for him to be just from the start, see, some, some, see, there, before, there, some... before COVID, uh, my baba told me that his uh, cousin in Nigeria is he, he, a Nigerian. That his cousin wants him to do this, and he wants. Okay, I said to him, "See, okay, your cousin, where does he live?" He told me, and I told him, "You can, you can recommend a business to, for him, for him and his friends. Right? There are so many cars in your neighborhood passing you. All he needs, all he needs, yeah, buckets." Clot, hmm? worked out. Get it. Get it. Okay. He's a young man. Yeah. And he open a car wash. Open a car wash. Even if you don't open a car wash, go to the houses to wash it in their house. Okay. I I I said open the car wash and then some other other customers who want you to come to their house, go. They will pay you. Pay you. All you want is money. They will pay you. You collect your money during daytime. Eh? If you want to flex to your girlfriends, in the evening, you wear fine clothes and you flex. Well, uh, my baba talked to his cousin and his cousin was angry that asking me to be a car wash. Look at it. So, so young young people, unfortunately, uh, don't get it. Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. If you do things that add value to people people's lives, they will pay you for it. You see, let, let, let me maybe I should I should make this illustration and probably end with this. There's something they say garbage in garbage out. Yes. Now. That same concept of garbage in garbage out. I Meaning, if you put in garbage, you get out garbage. Mm. You can flip it and say value in, value out. Yeah. Putting value in a place, you get value in a place. Exactly. Now, you can also invert it and say when there's no value that you put in, you can't get a value out. And that also functions with 
us as human beings. Mm. I think that a lot of young people, when you tell them create value, provide value, they, they don't have any value to give out because many of them have never invested in, in, the, in themselves. Value themselves. Yeah. You can't expect to give out what you have never put in. And which is why I tell people, I mean, sometimes we're in this same city of Uyo, some people are coming to you. I mean, people on the likes of Ibuku and Wushika are coming to town and they are in the hall, maybe it's 10,000 naira to get a seat in the hall. I tell them, guys, let's go and you sit. Well, two hours meeting, 10,000 naira. What are we going to hear? And I'm like, this is why you will remember where you are. As simple as Bible, I have my staff. I, I, my, my library is quite big too. I mean, I have behind me, all around me, there are books. Mm. I give my staff books to read. But there are some of them I give a book to read and I tell them, you have two weeks to return my book. Yeah. In two weeks, you don't return it. I just stop giving you books. I just tell them, this one is not ready to grow. Give it six months. Those that came in together with them who have been reading. The exponential movement is yeah. just because suddenly they are thinking when I'm making some illustrations, they can relate yeah. because they are now reading things. So I think another thing you should do is learn to invest in yourself. Yeah. It is that investment in yourself that will make you see opportunities. They say every problem is an opportunity. Yeah. Right. There is tell show me one continent that has more problems than Africa. No, none. That should tell you that there's no place with as many opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's on every street. Every street. Every house. Everywhere there's an the opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I have more business ideas than I have the capacity to execute. I have a folder on my phone, on my laptop. Just business ideas. I just see a problem. Sometimes I even go as far as doing research. Research it, find the suppliers, find everything. Biogas, tire recycling. Business ideas in my computer that I cannot... In Nigeria, when you change your tire, you leave it to the organizer. Yeah. From Sokoto to my to Zampara to Potako, tires are everywhere. You can fill up three last with tires. Nobody is thinking of what to do with them. Recycling, them. I mean, there are opportunity. Every street is opportunity in Africa. Until people have the capacity to think, yeah. then their eyes will start seeing opportunities. Yeah. The things are there, but until your mind is open, your eyes will not open. Yeah, that's true. That's so true. I think every young person, I just need to mention that so that the young people listening to this can realize yeah. that. that yeah. That what you are looking for is around you. See, for- once you have problem, there's an opportunity. There is what, your own pers- personal problem. The solution you can also give it to other people. To other people. Yes. That's it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 So, uh, David, uh, I've been very, very happy to talk to you. Hmm? It's see, my pleasure. See, the kind of work you're doing is uh, is it innovative. Okay, and uh, uh, I pray that uh, everything you are doing will bear wonderful, abundant fruits. Amen. All right. Amen. So let let let's end this. See what I ask my guests at the end of our discussion is uh, their vision for Africa. You see, what do you see? In Af- what do you envision for Africa in the next 30 years? Mm, in the next 30 years? Well, I, I for me, it's very simple. Okay. My business vision that says every young person should be able to launch their first startup by 16. Mm. That's my first vision. What I see that becoming is that young people are able to convert opportunities around them to a point where Africa, I see Africa becoming the Wakanda that we watch in movies. Yeah. That's the picture I see. That is what I see. Where young people everywhere, small innovations are just taking, are just springing up from corners everywhere. Every, I mean, up everywhere. We have all the raw materials are here. All the natural resources are here. Everything is here. We just need to use our minds a little bit more mm. and add value all around us. Yeah. And Africa is going to become a destination. If yeah. America could go from what it was, mort- child mortality rate in America was higher than Africa of today. Oh, of course, yeah. If they mm-hmm. can get to where they are today, I think Africa, I think that that movie, Black Panther, is a prophetic movie. Mm-hmm. And I think, I mean, so each time I look at it, in fact, I almost named my company Wakanda Academy. <laughs> <laughs> but because, no, 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 that's, 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 that's going to be very, so let me yeah. leave that look. But I see that picture in the future. Yeah. That's where I see us getting to. 
And we're not going to get there with the 63-year-old average leaders. <laughs> 12, 13-year-olds, the future of Africa are those teenagers. Is that, is, is that's, why we, is that's, that's why I'm focusing on them. Good, good, good. Yeah. Wow, David, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being a great guest of Think Big for Africa podcast. Thank, thank you. you so much, Mr. Ikena. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, too. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Wow. Wonderful.